and his, and his reflections on this. I quote from him from his wonderful little article called The Three R's for Ministry in the City. John said this at Urbana in 1976 and he published it in 1977. In talking about redistribution, he said this, we must as Christians seek justice by coming up with means of, contribute, of redistributing our goods and wealth to those in need. We well, how well a ministry can begin the process of creating a stable economic base in the community determines the motivation of the ministry. Is it simply charity or is it really trying to develop people and to allow them to begin to determine their own destinies? It also determines the long-range effectiveness of a body's commitment to neighborhood. For without an economic base, there will never be a launching pad for ministry. The long-term goal must be to develop a sense of self-determination and responsibility within the neighborhood itself. Now, many of us for a long time have been involved in helping to develop the financial capacity of adolescents and their families. It's important to do. But because of intergenerational poverty, I don't think we can rest just on developing capacity. We have to move to a capability model. Now here I've been deeply influenced by the, by the Indian social economists, um, Amaretta Sen and Martha Nussman. Because it, there's a difference between capacity and capability. A capability is a combination of functionings that enable a person to pursue their well-being. A functioning is an achievement. A capability is the ability to achieve, the ability to do, the ability to implement one's choices. Now, obviously, financial capability can't explain poverty. It can't explain inequity. It can't explain inequality or well-being. But what it can do is that it can give one the tools and the framework to conceptualize and evaluate poverty and then to pursue one's goals in life and make decisions. Now here's why I tie financial capability to intergenerational poverty. Those of us that work in situations of intergenerational poverty understand how precarious life can be. And we understand that too much vision, too much hope is bad because of the cycle of the welfare check, because of the cycle of subsidized housing. So therefore, to encourage a young girl in secondary four, in grade 10, to go on to Sejep and university is an unbelievably precarious proposition in my neighborhood. Because the extended family of at least grandma and mom understand that at 18, that person can go on subsidized housing get the welfare check, receive the extra benefits that affect the family. If one doesn't opt for that, one gets ostracized from the family. Too much vision, too much hope is scary. And so this is why a financial capability model presents a way to address the issues of intergenerational poverty. We have to do it with adolescents, that's for sure. We've got to do it with the whole community. I was actually a, a graduate student um, in, uh, in Montreal that clicked us into this, and she's helping us implement this right now in Montreal. And we came upon it in a, in a really fun way. It's a fun story to tell. Many of you are familiar with the ministry, uh, Opportunity International. Opportunity International, which does a lot of micro-enterprise ministry around the world. Uh, wanted to find a way to engage Canadian teenagers. So they gave to community development projects $100. And they said, see what you can do with $100. And then with whatever profit you make, you can give it to kids in Colombia. It, it was a marvelous initiative. 
Uh, this grad student sat down with our kids in one of well, this one center where my, uh, in the neighborhood where my wife works, but she doesn't work in the center. And, uh, and Julia got 15 kids to imagine what they could do with 100 bucks. Now, it's not a lot of money. But for kids in high school, 100 bucks is 100 bucks. These kids began to think about what they could do. They went to the finest chocolatier in Montreal because they wanted to learn how to make chocolate. They then started their own company and they made chocolate, fine chocolate, for Mother's Day last year. It was a huge success. They paid back the 100 bucks. They used that 100 bucks to leverage another 400 bucks. They paid back that 400 bucks and they ended up making 500 bucks that they sent to Columbia. Now these are kids that live in this community of deep poverty, intergenerational poverty. There was never one minute, Julia said, when those kids said, wait a minute, we need to keep some of this money for ourselves. But kids are not stupid. They said, if we can do it for Columbia, why can't we do it for ourselves? And some of those kids have negotiated with another ministry. They negotiated with my wife, who became the banker. Um, they've, they, they've negotiated now with the credit union, the Caisse Populaire in the neighborhood. And these kids have now started, another, they've kept, kept the company going. They've made another whole set of money, which now they're investing. They've got the Caisse Populaire matching their earnings. They've got another group to match their earnings. But the whole time, they're learning about, what's a budget? When, when you get your bill for your cell phone, do you know how to read it? That's an art form in and of itself. <laughs> when you get on the computer, do you know how much it costs to download stuff? But when you put money in your bank account, but you have a bank card, do you understand how it works? And all of a sudden, there is a financial literacy. Now, what have those kids done? Those kids have said, our moms need to learn this. And so now, all of a sudden, they're trickling. Now, these kids, every one of them in this project, made a couple hundred bucks of profit off the second round of the chocolate uh, initiative. Um, that was matched so that they've got a nice little bank account right now. But, Kids like to talk, okay? So kids tell their friends. And so now friends want to join the project. Now, interesting, they want to join the, pro the project when it's time to make money. So what's Julia decided? Julia's decided, no, wait a minute, the next cohorts that come in, the first round, you start off with 100 bucks, you make the chocolate, you give all of the profits to Columbia. Then you go back into the project. What are you doing? You're developing financial <coughs> capability. My friends, as we think about sustainable urban community development, Canada style, we've got to deal with the issues of intergenerational poverty. <coughs> it's about capacity, that's for sure, but it is fundamentally about <coughs> literacy and capability. Let me just conclude then with a couple of thoughts. Um, I think that when we think about the city, this is part of what makes missional theology so much fun. Because now we're beginning to understand that the triune God, who is the God at work in the neighborhood through his church, is a missionary God, a community, a social community, in action. And he invites his people into the Trinity to be the copycat of this missional God. And so in the community, we're the copycat of God in the neighborhood. And this is why churches need to be an integral part of community development. This is why we need to partner with the credit unions, with the borough officials, with city officials, because then the church becomes the entity that's interpreting the triune God in the neighborhood. And it's out of that that we can bear witness to the God of Jesus 
in word and deed. Back about 50 years ago, the wonderful Anglican British uh, historian Stephen Neal wrote his book, which he entitled um, A History of Christian Missions. It's one of the, the best books on the history of, of mission uh, that's ever been published. But in it, he concludes by talking about a, a tendency to define everything as mission. And he writes this, he says, if everything is mission, nothing is mission. My friends, I will take deep exception with him, even though I deeply respect him as a historian. If everything is mission, then everything is mission. <laughs> and that's why we need to take sustainable community development so seriously. Because we're committed to being the copycat of the triune God in the neighborhood. And we're there for the peace and well-being of the neighborhood to address the issues of this public-private divide and the public sociability which is so under attack. But at the same time to address the issues of intergenerational poverty and the just redistribution of resources in the neighborhood. Thank you.